Good afternoon, I'm Ed Puzwoli, President of Trip Scott, and welcome to another webcast. Today we have the honor of having Senator Jeff Brandis from Pinellas. Senator, welcome. Thank you, glad to be here. Well, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, you're a strong voice for criminal justice reform. Talk to us a little bit about some of the ideas and the agenda for the upcoming session in that area. So I think if you think about where we find ourselves today, um, we have a prison system that's really in crisis. It's in crisis in leadership, it's in crisis in facilities, it's in crisis in pr finding prison guards, frankly. The upside is we have a 4.7% unemployment rate in Florida, which is great, unless you're trying to hire prison guards at $32,000 a year, right. which um, creates a situation where about a third of our guards will turn over any given year. Um, and so we find ourselves in an area where, where we're really um, in, a ch in a challenging place to reform the system. The interesting thing is this is a conversation that's going on around the country, being led by states like Texas, um, who have in fact closed three facilities and are really looking at sentencing reform and, and criminal justice reform overall as a conservative issue, which historically people wouldn't have thought that that would be the stance. And so uh, I think this, there's an opportunity to really show some leadership in Florida and take, take this issue on and really look at the system overall and what we can do to, to create a better criminal justice system for a state. So where do we go from here then? With those ideas, with those, that cornerstone, what do we do? Uh, in addressing this? So I think a couple of things. One, we have to find money in to, to get into the system. Uh, we find ourselves uh, with critical staffing levels. Essentially all of our facilities are at a skeleton crew level staffing. Um, and our inmates aren't getting what I think are the needed educational opportunities uh, for them. We know that one thing that really reduces recidivism inside our prison system or when individuals get out of our prison system is if they have skills to hold a job. And, and so what can we do to create a, a so better high system? High school diploma, GEDs. High school diploma, a trade, GEDs, all of those types of things. But we, it takes money to provide those services. Uh, and so how do we uh, get more guards inside the facilities and then provide better services? without taking two or three or four hundred million dollars out of education or health care um, and putting it inside the prison system, how do we take the funds that are inside the prison system and use them more effectively and more efficiently? And that's really the conversation that we're driving um, in the state right now. How about the, the distance between uh, where a prisoner is sentenced and their family, it seems to me? It's one of the other major issues is if we can keep people closer to home and they get more family visits, that also has a very strong correlation to lower recidivism. And so we're looking at those types of opportunities. For example, can we keep people at the county jail longer where they're still housed inside the facility, but they have a, the ability to, to have interactions with their family and continue those bonds? And from a programming standpoint and educational opportunities, what are some of the ideas that are being banded around now. So I think some of the things that we're talking about are putting aside charter schools inside of our prison systems and really letting the innovation that occurs inside charter school systems, whether that be in the vocational technical space or uh, getting people to a high school degree space. But oftentimes, uh, prisoners are entering the facilities reading at a fourth grade level, spending five years with us, and still reading at a fourth grade level when they leave, and that's unacceptable. Well, what's the percentage of uh, prisoners or those that are under state supervision that are under you know, age 20, 21. So we have 100,000 people in supervision. About 20% uh, of those uh, individuals will spend uh, the most of their life in prison. Um, so 80% are going to get out. Of those, about, uh, about two thirds um, are reoffending. And so we're really looking at a third of those will never reoffend. Um, and then uh, many of those individuals, though, will get out and they'll reoffend and they'll find their way back into the prison system. And Florida has a high recidivism rate a lot of times because, I, I believe, because they're too far away from their family or they're not getting the needed services to hold the job when they get out. Okay, so those are the ideas that you'll be addressing hopefully this session. Those are two of the major areas that we're really working on is, is how do we have a tough conversation um, about our prison system in order to really address it, uh, the kind of global challenges that we see. We can play whack-a-mole with policy all day long and try to move the needle here or there. What we really need is a comprehensive review, a really a, an overhaul of the entire criminal justice system in Florida. Okay. Let me switch gears a little bit and um, address transportation. And one of the more um, interesting uh, discussions uh, that have been that has been going on deals with driverless cars. Right. We did see a little bit of controversy around some of that, but Florida leads, from what you said before, Florida leads in the driverless car uh, cutting edge with respect to legislation and policy. Tell us, tell our viewers a little bit about that. 
So we've been working on this area of policy for about five years now. I watched a TED talk on, uh, on autonomous vehicles and was just captivated by this uh, five or six years ago and began to think about um, what we can do in legislation to really pave the way for states. And so if you think about uh, how, how that differs from aviation, most aviation laws are handled at the federal level. Right. Most traffic safety laws are handled at the state level. And so in my conversation with Google and some of the other major auto manufacturers, we said, look, there, there really needs to be a state that, that, that has an open mind and takes leadership in kind of drafting legislation on this issue. And so Florida has been doing that for the last five years and really leads the nation in thinking about, at least legislatively, the future of, of, of autonomous vehicles. And the, the benefit of this technology is really incredible. Um, for example, uh, cars are only utilized about 5% of the day. For about an hour out of every day, people are spending in cars. And about 95% of all accidents are caused by human error. And so if we can utilize cars more throughout the day, and we can reduce the amount of human error uh, accidents, we can transform cities, we can transform communities and, 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 and change lives. And that's the, the upside of this technology. What is the timing of this? Are we talking 10 years, 20 years, or five years? So I think you're gonna to begin to see the, the transition within the next two years, okay. and then um, it will only grow from there. Cars will only be more safe going forward, and this technology will only grow in the, in the vehicles today. Now now go back to some of the potential impacts of, say, uh, you know, uh, the cars uh, being uh, driverless, uh, let's say a higher percentage as, as they get rolled out. Say that's 50% of the cars are driverless or 25%. What are some of the impacts that you foresee? So a couple of things. One, I think you're going to see a car ownership change. So people from go, will go from having three cars in their family to two cars in their family to one car in their family. And for many trips, they'll decide to take um, a, a, a you know, press a button, get a car, um, an autonomous vehicle to their destination. And that will be priced at, let's say, 25 to 40 cents a mile. Uh, so very economical for, for families to, to make that choice. It also gets older people out of, the, out of the house. Correct. And so if you think about Florida's aging population, um, it provides much more mobility. Um, but if cars are, are not parking and they're going back essentially into the grid, uh, our downtown's change. We don't need as many parking spaces downtown and so forth. We, we dedicate so much area of our, of our communities to parking. Um, you're going to see those be able to be recaptured and reutilized and repurposed and that's really exciting. But the ripple effects don't end there. If you think about our trauma centers at our hospital, the majority of our traumas are from car accidents and so trauma centers change. Um, we're kind of moving into this mobility as a service model. Um, that, that really I see kind of Uber and Lyft as the canary in the coal mine and, and, and as to where this can go. But we're already seeing uh, the implications of this uh, kind of begin to ripple through the economy. Where would some of those impacts be, say, on mass transit as an example? Because there's a big discussion in this community around mass transit funding and how we try to get that accomplished. So mass transit, if you think about light rail as a system in an urbanized environment, is going to cost you about $100 million a mile. And if you do the, the napkin math on it, um, uh, on uh, you know per mile of route, so I mean, you can quickly spend billions and billions of dollars in a mass transit system, and then it's going to take you between t ten and fifteen years to acquire all of the real estate and and actually build the system itself, and then you're only going to capture about twenty percent of the operating cost of that in ridership, and um, and you still have to get passengers to and from the mass transit station. This the ability of this technology really to offer you a point to point system to solve that what we call first and last mile problem is really where I think the transformational aspects of this is. Um, I think this is as big of, of, of a transition in our lives as moving from the horse and buggy to the Model T. It's going to affect every aspect of our lives and it's going to transform mass transit um, as we know it. Uh, and it's going to offer us great opportunities for the future. So what is the Florida legislature doing about uh, the anticipated uh, technology revolution in this area? So I think right now we're in this kind of interesting time between the lightning and the thunder where we know something is going to happen, but really nobody knows what, what, what experience it's going to, to, to be. So uh, I think the legislature's really gone kind of as far as it's going to go on this, this area for a while. We really need to let technology, this is one of the weird, strange areas where the, the law is actually in some ways ahead of the technology. So we need to let the technology catch up so that we have more visibility. My goal right now, and what I've told uh, our kind of our transportation planners, uh, is let's focus on maximizing our options. 
I think that's the best way to play uh, kind of the unknown world that we're entering into. And so uh, at every area we're looking at, the question I consistently ask is, does this maximize our options for whatever the future holds? So as chairman of the Senate Transportation Committee, beyond what we just talked about, are there infrastructure goals both around anticipating that change and just general infrastructure goals that you see at next session or two? So I think if you think about the challenges that the state faces, we're, we're internally saying that there might be another 6 million people in the state by 2030. There's 20 million people today in this state. So, right. I mean, it's, it's a huge, huge growth in this state. And the transportation challenges that puts on top of 100 million tourists that we expect um, annually, um, it, it kind of begins to let you think through the transportation challenges going forward. Um, the upside of this technology is it'll allow you to double or potentially triple capacity out of existing infrastructure. But that means we also have this, this, this large amount of time, the next 10 or 15 years, where we have to be thinking about how do we improve infrastructure um, around the state, focusing on maximizing our options as well. And that's why we've moved into this managed lane concept and, and allowing new capacity roads, roads to have some type of managed lane component. Well, this has allowed us to spend billions and billions of dollars of bonding capacity um, in facilities that are, are, are managed. Uh, and this has allowed us to, to improve both uh, traffic in the managed lanes and the unmanaged lanes as well. Jeff, I really do. Senator, I, I got to tell you, I really do appreciate uh, your uh, considerable leadership in these areas. And on behalf of everybody at Trip Scott, thank you very much. My pleasure. Glad to be here. I appreciate it.